Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Career Chat. I am Shannon Crooks, a librarian three at the Hillcrest Heights branch. Today, we have a special guest with us, Kevin C.A. from the Samuel Ogle School, and he is a teacher, and he's going to be telling us more about his career. As always, we hope that to today's career chat helps you explore various careers in PG County, as well as gives you an idea of what it's like to explore a different career that you may not have thought you were interested in. We probably have teens watching us today who are thinking about their next steps after high school, uh, as well as college students who have, may have just graduated or are still attending college, and they're also thinking about what they want to do after they graduate. So, um, Kevin, as we talk throughout our discussion, you know, if you have any additional feedback that you would like to give our viewers, please feel free to do so. We may okay. also have some adults that may be transitioning into a new career or exploring different careers available to them in the community. So, let's go ahead and get started, Kevin. So first of all, tell us a little bit about how long you've been working for the Samuel Ogle School and what your position is there. So this is actually, we're going into my second year coming up for the 2020-2021 school year. Mm -hmm. um, I just left my previous school, which was a charter school. Um, so I work as an eighth grade math teacher I teach eighth grade math and I also teach algebra one to those students who are in that class as well. Okay, great. And is this a high school that you work for? No, it's a middle school actually. Okay, yeah. great. All right, so my first question for you is what was your educational path from high school to where you are now? Oh, oh my, my path is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> when I left high school, I remember having a conversation with my parents about what I would do and not knowing what I would major in, but I knew that education was big for them, so I knew I was going to college. Mm -hmm. um, and so because I like to tinker with electronics and take things apart and put them back together, my dad was like, and my mom were like, hey, well, maybe engineering. Mm -hmm. So I enrolled at Morgan State as an engineer in 2006. Mm -hmm. So I went for electrical engineering, got into this pre-college program, dove deep into it. You know, it was really cool. And so as I was going through the program, I actually wasn't too fond of the coursework. Like the professors were great. The work was actually really interesting. But I realized that engineering itself might not have been for me. Mm -hmm. So... At the end of that year, I actually ended up leaving Morgan after my first year. Mm -hmm. And then I restarted over at Prince George's Community College. When I restarted, I did a complete reset. I started a new major in psychology because mm -hmm. I'd always like listening and talking to people and figuring out, you know, what's going on there. Mm -hmm. So PG Community College and then at PG, you know, I'm starting over, I need money. Mm -hmm. So I find a job on campus, luckily, and they have a tutoring center. Mm -hmm. So I ended up working in the tutoring center. And I thought that I was just going to be tutoring, you know, in a big open setting, you get one person. No, that was half the job. <laughs> the other half was me essentially facilitating the lab portion mm -hmm. and so i was literally facilitating the front of a class like a ta mm -hmm. so i was i was rightfully terrified when i first started because i'm working with adults and people who just came from high school and i'm like 19 and i'm supposed, <laughs> I'm supposed to be telling these people what to do and how to think and helping them mm -hmm. so you know i did that for about a year year and a half maybe mm -hmm. and so instead of finishing my associate's degree which was questionable i decided to just take my experience and transfer it over to Bowie. Okay. and so i finished out my psychology degree over at Bowie. Mm -hmm. and so while i was there once again i lucked into another position because i um 
I was taking a class when they were redoing the psychology department and their structure of the classes and they introduced the undergraduate learning um, position. Mm -hmm. And so I spoke to my professor at the time and you know, we went through my, my transcripts and my qualifications and what, why I wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And so she I ended up getting the position. Mm -hmm. And so once again, I'm like finding myself in this educator role mm -hmm. when it had nothing to do with my path <laughs> up until then. Mm -hmm. like, I wanted to be an athlete out of high school. Then I wanted to be an engineer. Then I want to be a psychologist but I keep finding myself in these educator positions mm -hmm. and I keep loving it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I take an education course just to kind of, all right, I'm finding this. Let's see what it's actually about. Mm -hmm. So I take an education one-on-one -on -one course. Mm -hmm. And while I'm taking this course, my professor was wonderful at the time. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Briscoe, she's still over there mm -hmm. at Bowie. Um, Dr. Briscoe, I remember she, she helped me navigate my own fears about it. Mm. And I ended up getting a student teacher position over at um, Bowie High School mm -hmm. because you got to fulfill that requirement. Mm -hmm. Loved it. The teacher I had at the time who I really wish that I could remember her name, uh, she helped me like design a lesson and implement it and walk through and facilitate the class. And it was this wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And so that is what like catapulted me. So I finished my bachelor's degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's telling me that if you want to become a school counselor, then I have to go further. And so that's kind of where I left it off for a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, not, not knowing what I wanted to do. And so currently, to finish off about my education, I'm back in school now. Okay. I'm going for my um, master's degree in education mm -hmm. for K-12 admin and supervision. Mm -hmm. With, I'm hoping to kind of lead that into education policy in the future. Mm. That's an awesome story and journey, um, especially <laughs> for uh, people who are maybe trying to decide what they want to do, but they have jobs or experiences along the way that kind of guide them in a different direction. So thanks for sharing that with our viewers, because I know a lot of people, when they're entering college, they don't really know quite what they want to do. They have an idea, but as they go through um, their classes and different um, maybe part-time jobs or full-time jobs along the way, they may decide that they can change. So thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, next question is, how did you get interested in your profession? You kind of touched on it um, when you were talking about your educational path, but did anything else inspire you to go towards the teaching field? So when I was, when I was starting out in education, um, like I said, it was the student teaching position at uh, Bowie High School that kind of truly sparked it and made me kind of see what teaching really was about. Mm -hmm. And so after I finished my senior year and got my uh, bachelor's, mm -hmm. I went and I decided to become a substitute teacher. Mm. So I was a substitute teacher in Anne Arundel County, actually. Okay. Now, mind you, I'm living in Largo at the time. Wow. So I'm traveling <laughs> from Largo to Anne Arundel to go to these uh, elementary and middle and high schools to kind of get my feet wet mm -hmm. because I felt like I, I, I couldn't figure out how to get in mm -hmm. and I didn't have the teaching certificate or the license or any of those pieces to kind of become a teacher. Mm -hmm. So this was my foothold into it to kind of get a grasp of it. And it was, it was a bit much traveling that far for that long because I did it for a little over a year. Wow. Um, so I stopped that and I actually became a 
sales associate at Staples. Mm -hmm. when, and this was when they first rolled out the cell phone division. Mm -hmm. So for part of that position, you're moving around all day. You're helping people with the normal stuff, but you're also talking to them about phones. Mm -hmm. And I told my manager at the time, you know, hey, I want to do education. And then this was just us having an offhand conversation about what we like outside of work. Mm -hmm. And there was a woman who came in and I will never forget her because my manager talked to her first mm -hmm. and then he told her, hey, I have this person who can help you. Um, and then he came over, found me, told me about his conversation. Mm -hmm. And then told me that she's starting a brand new charter school in PG County and she's looking for people, right? That's what I felt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he, he told me, he said, first, you better go help her get that printer. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was one of those big industrial office size printers from the top rack. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, well, I guess I got to climb the ladder now. Mm -hmm. And then he also told me, you better go talk about what you want. Right. And so I'm walking with her. I'm talking to her. Mm -hmm. And then I end up talking to her and helping her out with this printer to her car. Mm -hmm. And so at the car, we finish the conversation. And mm -hmm. she gives me her card and says, email me your resume and tell me like what you want to do. And we'll find a position for you at our school. Wow. And so... I, that was my intro and my, my jump starting into education. Mm -hmm. So at that school, I wasn't a teacher. Mm -hmm. I was actually a paraprofessional. Mm -hmm. And so that was my intro. And then I eventually got to becoming a teacher. Mm -hmm. But I, I, the, the experience of being a sub and a para is invaluable to be a teacher because you learn all the things that these other professionals that you work with go mm -hmm. through and their constraints and it helps you build on what you've done so like that's the long answer for how i got into it and you you bring up a great point about networking i think sometimes we take for granted the power of having conversations with people mm -hmm. just like you did in a totally different career path um, at uh, Staples, I think you said. Yeah. So I think some of our, our young people need to realize that having conversations with people in the community or people at your job can lead you to other opportunities or, or other doors that could open for your career path. So that's awesome. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Uh, mm -hmm. the next, next question is, how much time did you invest into getting to where you are? You, you again, touched on it a little bit, but... Um, what else did you do or what else could you give our viewers as far as what they could do? Um, I think it's, it's one of those things where it's experience is invaluable. Mm. Um, if you're thinking about doing education as your full-time career, mm -hmm. then experience is invaluable. Like, like you said, meeting people and, not just talking to people to say I'm talking to them or trying to figure out what you can get out of them for your career, mm -hmm. but truly having conversations and making a connection is what makes it so that this works. Because a good, a good majority of teaching is about your relationships mm -hmm. with the community, with your students, with your uh, coworkers, with anybody who decides to stop through for whatever reason, mm -hmm. you are a conduit and a facilitator. Like you're not the end all be all. Mm -hmm. And so I say the experience is the most valuable because if you don't have the best educational background, mm -hmm. then building up a body of experience that shows that you can do this. Mm -hmm. So that's, volunteering, internships, um, even just tutoring programs on the side because often people bring their kids. And so then you learn how to do and how to actually help a child, not just teach at them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
in terms of actually getting into the profession of teaching specifically, mm -hmm. there are uh, degree programs and, de and certification programs through colleges. If you are uh, fortunate and financially stable enough to pursue those, I highly recommend that people do that. Mm -hmm. um, there are alternative certification programs through counties and through the states that allow people who don't have that formal higher education background mm -hmm. to still enter the profession of teaching because they teach you the fundamentals, they teach you that foundational information that you need. Mm -hmm. So looking up alternative certification programs is great. Mm -hmm. um, and then if teaching isn't your in route, then maybe looking at, like I said, substitute teaching, mm -hmm. um, becoming a paraprofessional, someone who helps out in the classroom, but mm -hmm. isn't the main facilitator in the room. Mm -hmm. Like that can be a great alternative launching pad for you to see what you want and still get into it. Mm -hmm. So with the, the subbing and the paraprofessional positions, are there specific requirements in order to get into those jobs? Like are there age requirements or educational requirements for those positions? Typically, yes. Each, each district sets its own requirements. Mm -hmm. So um, like for PG, you can look at PG's website and you can literally just Google PGCPS substitute teaching. Mm -hmm. and you'll find the information for that. Um, and the only reason I'm not giving specifics is because I don't want to give something and then it, it's changed and then I'm leading somebody wrong. <laughs> right. um, but every district has its requirements. Okay. Um, most, you know, you got to have at least a high school diploma and you got to be 18 or older because they don't want you being 16 and then you're working in high school. <laughs> it's not a summer job type of position. Right, right. Um, but I would, like, I would suggest like literally just Googling whatever the district and then whatever the position. So if you want paraprofessional, sometimes those are listed under the um, jobs and career okay. writings. Mm -hmm. So where they list the others, um, cafeteria workers and custodians and teaching positions and principalships, mm -hmm. they usually have paraprofessional uh, positions mm -hmm. there as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, next question is, what kind of obstacles did you face in your pursuit of your profession in teaching? Um, the first was myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start there because I had to, you have to have a certain sense of confidence in yourself to be able to teach someone. Mm -hmm. Like you have to know that you have a command of it or a command of yourself to be able to learn whatever you need to learn to teach it. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm a math teacher. And so a lot of people are very comfortable saying, don't know math. Mm -hmm. I don't like math. <laughs> math was my worst subject. <laughs> like, can you tell I've heard this a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I had to kind of be comfortable with telling people, well, I understand, but I'm a math person. You know, like having that, that ability. And then on the other side of that, I also had to have confidence to know that I can break down this information because I struggled with math all the way up until I got through middle school. Like mm -hmm. I, I was good at the beginning of um, elementary school. Mm -hmm. And then when things started to become more abstract, I started to struggle with the, the formalized work. I could conceptualize it. I could understand what was being said to me. Mm -hmm. But grades and report wise, I struggled a bit. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, working with my parents and working on my own and my brother, mm -hmm. I was able to kind of get back on track. And then with some support through high school, I was able to start moving in a way that showed that I understood. Mm -hmm. And so that 
coming to terms with that reality Mm -hmm. and using that and learning from it Mm -hmm. was my way of kind of building the foundation. So reflecting and being comfortable with my own struggles and using that to break the information down for my students. Mm. Um, The other obstacle was finding an entry point. So I mentioned the college programs. Mm -hmm. I actually knew several people over at, um, at University of Maryland. So I applied. I said, you know, I know these people. They know me. I've worked with them before. I'll be able to get in. <laughs> I get in. <laughs> it, it did not happen. Wow. So, you know, like, I, I was a little deflated because mm-hmm. I was like, I, I, knew, I knew hands down that this was going to be my way. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't. It wasn't. And, and it was... The, the happenstance of being open to opportunity, like it was for getting the paraprofessional position mm-hmm. that allowed me to get into teaching mm-hmm. because it was an email forwarded from my mom from a random newsletter that talked about PG's alternative certification program. Mm-hmm. And so the resident teacher program was my way in, but I had never heard of it before this. Mm-hmm. I had never heard of this program. I didn't know it existed. I didn't know what I needed to do. Mm-hmm. And so in terms of hurdles, like you asked, it's being open to opportunity and seeing it for what it is. Mm-hmm. Like not being so fixated on, okay, I know these people, I'm going to do this thing, or people have said to do this thing, and this is the only path when mm-hmm. it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the th- the like third major hurdle was being comfortable in front of people. Um, I had a horrible stage fright growing up, like mm-hmm. stutters and shakes and <laughs> like <laughs> it looked like I was gonna blow away at the wind. <laughs> Whenever I stood up in front of people, uh-huh. and so you know, like the idea of standing in front of now this large group of people. Mm-hmm. horrifying wow. mm-hmm. but you know through college I wanted to be a um, I wrote I wrote poetry and spoken word mm-hmm. so I did performances to kind of help myself get over it okay. one here another one there you learn to be comfortable in front of people yeah and so getting myself comfortable with the things that I know are deficits Mm-hmm. standing in front of people speaking your own thoughts standing confident in your own thoughts like that's kind of what you got to do as a teacher like, mm-hmm. you can't be afraid of being in front of people and then stand in front of 30 plus it's not gonna work <laughs> and especially since i work with middle schoolers mm-hmm. right they are going to see it and they are going to know it <laughs> oh Man. And capitalize upon it. <laughs> I'm telling you. Like I I love how I love how aggressively honest my middle schoolers are mm-hmm. because it's a constant evolution for me. Mm-hmm. Like it, I feel comfortable with something and then the next year comes and you learn something new about yourself and you learn to develop a new skill or improve on something like that's that that self-reflection piece Mm -hmm. and knowing your own deficits and being comfortable with it Mm -hmm. man I can't tell you how much how far that's actually let me come yeah and that's really with all careers as you go throughout your career you are faced with challenges obstacles sometimes you get it right sometimes you don't quite get it right but you sit back and you evaluate what did i do good what did i do wrong what can i improve upon so um, i'm glad you touched upon that because sometimes we get so fixated on hey i got this certification or this degree i know my stuff and um, I can just conquer the world without any failures, but there's going to be failures along the way, you know, and it's just a process of, of learning and um, strengthening your skills throughout. Um, so we're always learning. So thanks for sharing that. 
the next question is, what advice do you have for someone wanting to do what you do as a teacher? You touched on a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Find purpose in it. Okay. Um, a lot of times people talk about teaching as a passion. Mm -hmm. And it is, most certainly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, passion helps you find the highs and enjoy those highs. Mm -hmm. Purpose helps you weather the lows. Um, figure out why you want to do it. And then once you find out why you want to do it, mm -hmm. become rock solid in that why. Mm -hmm. I'm, I want to do it because I love helping the younger generation. Mm -hmm. helping, the, helping the people who came after me is my why for a vast majority of things. Mm -hmm. And so that's my rock solid way of weathering the difficulties that come with it. Mm -hmm. So as my advice for people who are entering the profession, who are looking at the profession, mm -hmm. who are, you know, somebody said, hey, you know, you taught me a bunch. You might be, you might want to become a teacher. You might be great at this. Like, even for those incidental offhand comments that make you go, hmm, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, think don't don't mull, don't become anxious over it, but figure out your why. Mm. Why do you want to do this? Why might this be something to become your full-time occupation? Mm. And once you find that, move with it. Don't don't question, don't second guess, move with it and immerse yourself in what it what's it, what it's about to become for you. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, that's, that's great advice because a lot of times we choose careers based on how much money we're going to make mm -hmm. or what location we can work in, but really deciding your purpose is, is wonderful as far as the drive that, you know, gets you to get up every day and go tackle this, this mm -hmm. career. So yes, thank you for that. Um, next question is, uh, well, you've, answered this but are there any additional places that you've worked with worked in the industry you told us about several but are there any in addition to the ones you've mentioned so i was a private tutor mm -hmm. um i did that for about two years where i just worked with individuals okay um i also worked with one of those online uh tutoring programs where people can go to their site to hire you as more of a private contractor, more so than an employee of that company. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I was a substitute teacher. I was a paraprofessional. Mm -hmm. um, I've also done test proctoring. Okay. So I've, I've proctored the SAT, which is a, it's a very interesting experience to watch other people take a test. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is an interesting, like, I remember being on that side of things. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that help you when you were a proctor in your teaching career, like seeing people take a test and get anxious and overwhelmed? So it, it taught me that everything doesn't need to be as serious as people make it. Mm. Like, Oft, too often, not oftentimes, too often you see students who get test anxiety and they get all balled up in knots. And it's either for the anticipation of the content. Do I know it? Do I understand it? Am I going to do well in the test? Mm -hmm. But also it's on the other side. I, what is this going to say about me? Mm -hmm. What are people going to read about me when they see this? Mm -hmm. So people get balled up in knots. And so I could see that on these 17, 16, 17, 18 year old faces while they're taking the SAT. Mm -hmm. And so it was weird to see it. And so it, it taught me that if I'm going to help them do better at this one, mm -hmm. I like there's a, there's a very, very strict set of rules that goes for test proctoring mm -hmm. because they have to make sure that the standards are held. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that you have to be cold. Mm-hmm. Um, that you can still have a personality and show your personality through it. And that helps somebody who's feeling anxious kind of relax a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so I tried, I try to take that into my teaching because eighth grade, my kids take two large tests. Like now they take the PSAT, mm-hmm. they take the um, large, the national MCAT. Mm-hmm. So those are two massive tests. And then there is a battery of county tests. And then my personal tests, for, like they get tested a lot. Mm-hmm. So, you know, allowing the students to see your personality and allowing them to kind of ease into it and relax and allow themselves to come through in mm-hmm. their work mm-hmm. produces better results. Mm-hmm. Like, if a child is tight, wound tight and anxious, then their brain is focusing on that and the content. It's not putting its all into what it's writing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you really want a child to do well, they need to be able to focus on it. They don't need to be worried about all this other stuff. Right. And too often our children are stressed out. Mm-hmm. They, they have a, a thousand stresses in and out of school. Mm-hmm. So learning how to spot it, learning how to kind of ease a child out of it. Mm-hmm. I, I can't tell you how, how many times I've, t- I've had kids tell me that being in the room where it wasn't, you gotta do this, you gotta be great, you gotta have this, was better for them. Mm-hmm. Like that's, it's, it's, it's a much better environment and it produces much better results. Yeah, so by being a proctor, it gave you an inside scoop mm-hmm. on how you know kids feel about test taking because that is a lot of what they do in school. They take quizzes, tests, exams, standardized tests, really throughout their whole educational career. So you having that inside uh, view as a proctor, which some of our viewers may not know what a proctor is, but it's really a person who oversees a test taker, make sure they have what they need, make sure the equipment works right for the test, make sure they're not cheating or doing anything fraudulent. Mm-hmm. Um, you were able to get that firsthand knowledge of, hey, this student may need a little bit more support when it comes to preparing uh, mentally to take a test, mm-hmm. uh, being able to relax and calm down. So yes, that's an excellent experience. Um, and so when you were a proctor, was this after you got your bachelor's degree or during the time, same time? What kind of timeline was that? So the proctor was actually after I became a teacher already. Okay. Um, one of my coworkers, she had been doing it mm-hmm. and she mentioned it and I asked her about it. And so she got me in contact with someone who oversaw proctoring. Okay. And so that's how I got into it. And that was really a great time for you because you're mm-hmm. fresh out of school, you're a teacher, you're, you're about to go into the classroom. So now you're seeing, okay, maybe I need to also think about how do I prep kids for test taking. Mm-hmm. Um, excellent experience. Um, next question is, um, how has teaching changed since COVID-19? <laughs> how has it not? Um, (laughs) the only thing that has not changed is the fact that, one, you have a curriculum you got to follow, two, there are students you have to teach, (laughs) and three, there are administrators. Everything else about it has changed. Mm -hmm. The, like, the way you have to think about your curriculum has to change Mm -hmm. because you need to have, in my opinion, you need to have a, a greater command of it, mm-hmm. of your subject matter, in order to break it down in a manner that makes it meaningful for somebody who's viewing it on their own. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, picking a, a YouTube video mm-hmm. or a Khan Academy video or an illustrative mathematics uh, 
thing. Like there are, there are a thousand different sites that provide information mm -hmm. and simply giving them that information is not teaching. Mm -hmm. Teaching is being able to adjust to the level of the child and ensuring that they can then meet the standard that you're setting. Mm -hmm. And they can then go beyond your standard and meet their own. Mm -hmm. right? And so you need to make sure that you know what you're doing and you know what you're supposed to be teaching. Because in a classroom setting, if I'm working with one small group over here and I realize, okay, maybe I, maybe I need to take a half a second and then I can go and I can correct the misconceptions for an entire group. I can do that in the moment. Mm -hmm. When you're online and things are asynchronous, so I may be delivering something to one group, but another group's going to view it later. Mm -hmm. You don't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit more pressure to kind of make sure that things are right the mm -hmm. first time you deliver them mm -hmm. and make sure that it's not just right, but it's broken down and built out in a meaningful enough way that the students can get it, follow it, expand upon it. Mm -hmm. And it's also open enough that they can put themselves and their own thoughts into it. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, one of the things that eighth graders need to know is the Pythagorean theorem. Mm -hmm. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Mm -hmm. People have drilled that formula for years and years. Mm -hmm. But having to deliver things electronically from a distance, mm -hmm. I can't just give them a formula and draw a diagram. Mm -hmm. I have to provide a few different avenues for them to kind of relate to it. I can't say, hey, go back and go uh, find a picture of something mm -hmm. and we'll bring it back to class and we'll break it down as a whole group. Mm -hmm. Because you may not get everybody in your live session. Mm -hmm. You may not get everybody to view it or to participate in a group chat. Mm -hmm. In a classroom, that's fine. They can still hear you. Mm -hmm. But I can't guarantee that they're hearing me through this platform. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that all of that dynamic shifting. And then on top of that, you kind of have to learn new platforms. You got to learn the video conferencing platforms. Mm -hmm. You have to learn the platforms to deliver the information to them. You got to learn where to get the information from. Are you going to create it yourself? Are you going to purchase somebody else's? Are you going to go strictly from the textbook? Like you, you gotta, you gotta think about it in a completely different way. Right. Because I can't take a worksheet, upload it and expect the kids to get it. Mm -hmm. And I also can't upload it and expect them to put any thought into it. Mm -hmm. You got to do something different. You, online teaching is not simply taking your, your paper and pencil stuff and slapping it on a screen. Mm -hmm. The internet and technology is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you're finding ways to make the best use out of it. Teaching kids how to go and research for themselves. Mm -hmm. You don't understand? You have all of this internet at your disposal mm -hmm. find it mm -hmm. and then bring it back and we can discuss it mm -hmm. you want to know how to you know make a diagram you're no longer drawing on pen on um, a piece of paper and handing me this colored piece of paper mm -hmm. to showcase something mm -hmm. you can create it using the variety of technology technological tools whether on a tablet on a phone on a computer, each one of those modes requires a different way of interacting. Mm -hmm. Students play with it all the time. Yeah, they, do. they don't necessarily <laughs> they don't necessarily know how to translate that to an academics. So learning to get them to translate, mm -hmm. like these are things that teaching was doing mm -hmm. already, mm -hmm. but now it's a forced. You have no choice 
but to know you have no choice but to do this. And that is a massive mind shift, mind shift for educators and not just older educators because I'm not going to lie. I know some like 60 and 70 year old teachers, <laughs> they are rocking it out during this time. Like this is good and butter. And I know some like 20 year old teachers who are struggling. <laughs> yeah. So like, it's a lot of people assume that because someone's older, they're going to have difficulties. Mm -hmm. It's all in your mindset and what you're open to. Mm -hmm. And so this is forcing people to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I, I am a big advocate in leaning into that uncomfortable moment to come out better. Mm -hmm. So while I don't like the circumstances that produced this, because it, it is tragic on so many different levels. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the profession of teaching as a profession, not just something people walk into, but an actual profession, will come out stronger because of it. Mm -hmm. I agree. You know, it's given all teachers and students and parents the opportunity mm -hmm. to be flexible, to learn technology. Mm -hmm. um, believe it or not, there are some people who get jobs, you know, they're qualified, they get the position, but then the technology piece is introduced and they are lost. Mm -hmm. So I think having kids use technology in a new way that they've never used it before will help prepare them for what they're about to face when they hit the job market. So. I think it's a great opportunity. Um, hopefully it gets better as time goes on, but yeah. I can see that, you know, it takes adjusting, flexibility, creativity, which you've talked about, and also supporting students, communicating with them and being um, creative about the way that you present the information. So yes, that can be really applied to all careers right now because we're all virtual. So, and it's yeah. fun. Hey, it, kids, kids are creative like they their brains go in places i have never thought to go <laughs> so you know like i like like you said with the creativity piece like mm -hmm. i asked i asked one of my kids to make a, a comic book like a little mm -hmm. comic strip based on some of the stuff that they learned mm -hmm. and the ways that they decided to describe these <laughs> concepts <laughs> I can't tell you how hard I was laughing. Wow. It is, it is amazing to see what they come up with. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they are very creative. <laughs> um, they've got their phones, they've got tablets, they've got um, computers at their disposal. So I think it's a great opportunity and I'm glad you know we're faced with it during COVID. COVID's tragic, you know, don't get me wrong, but um, looking for ways to get through it. Um, mm -hmm. Is always good. So yes, thank you for that. Um, the next question is: How can uh, young folks uh, who are still in school find volunteer opportunities to get started in your field? I know you talked about the tutoring, um, but that's a paid position. But volunteering, just in general, is there opportunities for that? So, if they're still in school and they're considering, because I've had some students who in like sixth grade, they were like, I'm going to become a teacher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. um, you know, the, the volunteering to either help younger students or help struggling students in your school mm -hmm. is sometimes a great opportunity. Um, okay. Volunteering to help out the, the local, like, libraries and other centers where people gather, you can set up and help people in that manner. Um, like even if it's just like your friends mm -hmm. who you know are struggling, mm -hmm. helping them helps you learn how to help someone else mm -hmm. because you need to adapt to them. And you also need to learn how to like relate to them with what they're going through and what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of what teaching is. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the hardest parts, adjusting to all of the different mindsets that you run into mm -hmm. and building lessons and learning how to assess and then 
the administrative piece of keeping track of all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, any volunteer experience that helps you relate to people, mm -hmm. um, reinforce content knowledge, mm -hmm. learn administrative and uh, task oriented skills, mm -hmm. like all of that comes into play. Mm -hmm. So if there are local community centers, or like I said, the library, mm -hmm. or sometimes even the schools will say, oh, you're an older student, like a high school student, mm -hmm. and you want to volunteer at, say, an elementary school for reading to children. Mm -hmm. That's a great entry point. People learn you, mm -hmm. families then learn you, mm -hmm. schools learn you, mm -hmm. and you now can have this resume filled with things that you've done mm -hmm. to say, I'm not just coming into this cold. I got a little, I got a little something to me mm -hmm. to, to back up what I want to do. Right. Like yeah. there's, that's the ones I can think of for right now. Yeah, and with the, I'll just speak to the library one. We do have volunteer positions. Once mm -hmm. we get more settled with regard to COVID, then, you know, we might open that back up. I'm not sure what that's going to look like for the future, but mm -hmm. we've had, we have had young people come in and volunteer and they do help uh, kids learn to read. Um, they have helped with the summer youth employment program, mm -hmm. uh, with doing lunches and, you know, with the summer lunches, they had to organize uh, with me how to set up the area, clean the space, um, count the amount of kids coming in, make sure the kids wash their hands. So that's kind of organizing and administrating and then lead a program during uh, lunch. So yes, volunteering at the library is a great place uh, to start. So I just wanted to say that to our viewers. Um, next question is, uh, what are key skills that young people should think about acquiring that apply to all career fields? Um, task management. Okay. Uh, knowing how to prioritize and being flexible enough to reprioritize as the task design, as the task needs. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm a math teacher, so I'm going to say some basic math skills. <laughs> um, and not just like addition, subtraction, but, you know, like some basic statistical knowledge. Mm. I'm looking at a graph of how things are going. Mm -hmm. How do I read and interpret this graph? Mm -hmm. People are talking about percentages a lot now. They're talking about um, parts of a whole a lot now. Mm -hmm. So having some working knowledge of that type of information. Mm -hmm. Don't have to be a master, don't have to be a mathematician, mm -hmm. but having some working knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. um, along with the, the math content, like basic math content, mm -hmm. some literacy strengths. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people confuse being able to read what's on a page and being able to understand what's on a page. Mm -hmm. A lot of any of the jobs that I've done in the past, mm -hmm. you get a memo, you get an email, you get a, a brochure, a manual, you get these things that tell you what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so being able to read it, understand it and apply it you know, these are skills that are necessary. Mm -hmm. um, people, like, in, like interpersonal skills, mm -hmm. knowing how to walk in a room and engage. Like you don't need to be the most socially outgoing person to know how to engage. Because as I said, crippling stage fright. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if somebody comes up to you, knowing how to say hi, engage with them, and then leave with having at least some semblance of a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, knowing how to follow instructions mm -hmm. and not in the uh, conformity I say you do, mm -hmm. but there are certain paths that do kind of need to be followed in certain circumstances mm -hmm. and knowing when to and when not to follow 
that discernment Mm -hmm. invaluable. Um, Working with technology, Mm -hmm. base level. You don't need to be able to build an app for every position, Mm -hmm. but you do need to know how to work within them. Mm -hmm. Um, I, a lot of times in schools, we're getting either like Chromebooks for everything or reading iPads for everything. Or back when I was growing up, you got Windows for everything. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times people become specialized in one of those areas. I think having a working knowledge of the major platforms, Mm -hmm. so Android, iOS, Windows, Mac, and just knowing how to work in them. You can watch YouTube videos and see how people navigate inside of them. Mm-hmm. But I don't want anybody, I, I do not want any young person walking into a job, having all the qualifications, being overqualified for a job. And then the thing that makes it so you don't get that job is you don't know how to work with a Mac mm-hmm. or you don't know how to work with Windows. Mm-hmm. or you don't know how like that should not be the barrier mm-hmm. that that will be a, a, an unfortunate barrier that's relatively easily mitigated mm-hmm. by kind of slowly but surely building that knowledge base mm-hmm. and finally i think that young people should know how to self-reflect um Think back on what you've done. Learn from your mistakes. Learn from your successes. Mm -hmm. Life is not all about getting like rave reviews. Mm -hmm. It's about getting those rave reviews, soaking them in, Mm -hmm. and then also knowing how to work through those struggling moments Mm -hmm. and figuring out what's going on. What happened? How did this happen? How can I avoid having this happen again? Mm-hmm. Because then you build yourself to the next rave review moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I want that to be the thing that sticks the hardest. Because if you reflect on yourself and you know you find a skill that you need to work on, mm-hmm. there are millions of avenues to find in how to work on it. That's but you've got to know it. You gotta recognize it. Right. And you gotta be willing to work on it. Right. So that critical thinking piece is key um, in uh, being successful throughout careers, various careers, not just teaching, but various mm-hmm. careers. Um, next question is what resources or recommendations do you have for people who want to pursue a career in teaching? Um so The internet, I'm going to say with a big old asterisk sitting up here somewhere. (laughs) Um, I want want people to know that the internet is a a widely available resource. Mm -hmm. You can find a lot there, but you can also find a lot of misinformation and you can be led down the wrong path. So, you know, use it, but don't just find one thing and, and stick with it. Mm-hmm. Um, the library. Mm-hmm. I'm, the, the library has language learning services that they, that it partners with. Mm-hmm. And so I'm actually using one of them now. Okay. Um, the library has, like, it, it has reference books for things that I'm trying to, to learn. Mm-hmm. And I use it all the time to borrow books and borrow audio books. Mm-hmm. So it's not for a lack of knowledge and lack of availability. Mm-hmm. And it is a freely available resource. Um, the next one would be your community. Mm-hmm. And I say community, and then I'll get to family. Because okay. I'm separating those two out, not to say that they're not joined together, like your family's not a part of the community. Mm-hmm. But I want people to realize that there's a wealth of knowledge in the people you're around. Mm -hmm. And so tapping into that knowledge 
can take you farther than you ever knew. Mm. Um, case in point, I bought in two steps away from an auction car. Mm-hmm. It was great car with lots of problems. Mm. And it wasn't until I started tapping into my community, i.e. some of my friends, some people I knew before, coworkers, and like I said, my family, mm-hmm. that I realized that I had sunk a lot of money into a car that I should not have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, and I'm not even upset about it because the process for learning how to maintain it, what was going wrong, having those conversations, now that, I'm, now that I've left that car behind, Mm-hmm. I now know way more than I did before to how to maintain a car. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like it, it's, it's random things that happen that when you tap into a community, you learn so much. Mm-hmm. And then finally, it's family. Mm-hmm. Um, family is what you're born with and what you choose. Mm-hmm. Um, Tapping into that resource that's so close and so supportive can help get people beyond where they are. Right. It can help, it can help you find and link out to these other resources like the library and internet resources and nonprofits. Mm-hmm. Um, they can go with you on this journey because you never know somebody might be doing it as well. That's true. Like if you're trying to become a teacher, you might learn that you have this aunt who's been showing up all the time, who was a former principal. Like this is, these are things that you learn, but you got to talk to them. You got to mm-hmm. ask them. You got to share what you're going through. Mm-hmm. And they might like, they might just take you on this whimsical journey to a museum. Mm-hmm. You never know. So, it, you know, it's the internet it's the libraries, it's your community, it's your family, and it's like nonprofits. Because these things are, nonprofits are there to help the community. Right. That's why nonprofits. Mm-hmm. They're not there to get your money, they're there to provide a service. Right. And so finding these things that were made to help you mm-hmm. can only help. Like it's, and it's, it's something that took me so long to learn and accept. It took me far longer than I should have. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until I became an adult that I truly accepted that, okay, I don't know everything I thought I knew. <laughs> okay, okay, let's see how this goes with asking for help. Oh, this is wonderful. Mm-hmm. You mean I don't have to figure it out myself? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Like, these are things that you want to learn as a child, but I was a little stubborn. I was, I was, I was a little stubborn growing up, so. The young yeah. people are a little reluctant sometimes to just start conversations with people or build relationships, but it's something that's invaluable, you know, throughout life. You know, you never know who you're going to get in contact with, who knows who that could possibly connect you with an opportunity or an experience like you talked about earlier to get you to the next level, to a career that maybe you didn't think about or a career that you want to get to or know more about. And also I like that you mentioned family, like, yeah, a lot of our family members are in careers that we know nothing about. Mm -hmm. We probably have never had conversations with them about their careers, but maybe it's a career that we might be interested in exploring and just opening that door for conversation about it really could help us uh, learn more about the career we're interested in. So thanks for mentioning that. And you also mentioned our language program, our resource, uh, Mango mm-hmm. Languages is what it's called. So uh, if we have viewers interested in uh, learning a new language, we have several languages you can learn for free with mm-hmm. Mango Languages. Um, so thanks for giving us uh, that plug for that. A um, uh, few more questions left. Um, next question is, what comments do you have about the industry of teaching that people entering may want to know? Um, that it is both wonderful and taxing. Mm-hmm. 
it is not all sunshines and rainbows. I'm gonna say that up front because like I said at the beginning, a lot of times people look and talk about teaching as like this passion project type thing. <laughs> and then, like for me, a passion project is, you know, a setting up your entertainment system. Like that's, that's a passion project. It's something that does nothing but give you pleasure and passion. <laughs> Teaching is not that. <laughs> it is a profession. It is a job. It is a career. Mm. And so it is a purpose driven project. Like it is a purpose driven career. Mm -hmm. You find it, you love it. And like anything else you love, it can bring you stress. Mm -hmm. But it can also take you to the highest highs you've ever known. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I would say is. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a a, a, a single lane highway. Mm -hmm. Like there are so many different ways to get into it, and there are so many different ways that it plays out, and there are so many different ways that you can infuse your individuality into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I recognize that every school system isn't the same, just like every school within every school system isn't the same, mm -hmm. and every building full of uh, co-workers isn't the same like it's the same with every job mm -hmm. but that does not mean that you can you still won't be able to live your purpose in this right um and then the final thing that i would say is that don't be afraid to learn i yes you're a teacher yes you're supposed to be teaching someone else things but that does not mean that you can't still learn from everyone around you, including your students. They will figure things out before you've even had a chance to realize that you need to know it. Mm -hmm. And if you're comfortable enough with them and they're comfortable enough with you, they will teach you without any shame. Mm -hmm. I have learned so many dances that made me look all types of embarrassing. <laughs> but they were like, my kids were willing to teach me. Mm -hmm. And that sharing of vulnerability mm -hmm. made it so that you build a stronger relationship. Um, yeah, like be, be comfortable being a lifetime learner because mm -hmm. your job is to teach these children how to learn and how to process the world around them. Mm -hmm. It just happens through the filter of whatever content area you're working with. Mm -hmm. Help guide them. You are not the end all be all for them. You are one teacher out of a sea of teachers that they're going to encounter. Mm -hmm. You do not need to take on all of their problems. But if you feel like helping them through their problems, I highly encourage it. Like, we should not try to exist as a monolith. We should not be trying to live by ourselves and hold the world on our shoulders. And this is not our job. It's not the purpose. Mm -hmm. Our purpose is to help guide them to the future. Right. Whatever mode you decide to do that with, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that would be my advice. Okay. Um, wonderful advice. Um, I like that you said that, you know, people should have a purpose really with any profession or career. People should have a purpose as to why they want to do it so that, you know, they can get up every day and go forth and conquer. Mm -hmm. And then I like that you said that people need to be team players. I mean, that's really with all professions is that we're working with a team pretty much 99% of the time. Um, and that requires relationship building, interpersonal skills, um, mm -hmm. being able to communicate. So I like that you also said that. Um, the last question is really for me is, what are some of the resources the library offers? We talked about the mango languages, but if you go to our website, which is pgcmls.info, um, and if you go to the how do I tab, and then the look for a job tab, you will see various different resources for job seeking. Um, if you are a veteran, there's a vet now where you can get more information about how to find a career, uh, you know, post being a veteran. And then 
there's also career transitions and job now where you can get help with resume writing. Um, you can get help with cover letter writing, interview skills, and so much more. So we hope that you explore our website as well as our other digital resources while you're at home. Again, Kevin, thank you so much for the interview. It was uh, very uh, enlightening to hear about everything about you know teaching your career path as a teacher, the, the obstacles you faced, and also the wisdom you've gained throughout your career. So again, thank you for joining us. And we hope that uh, our audience will join us each and every week for Career Chat, um, where you can explore careers that you may not have originally thought that you were interested in, or get more information on careers that you want to go forth and conquer. So thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you again next week. Bye-bye.